If you are a regular attender of Gospel City Church, you are already opening your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy. I'll meet you there in chapter 4. If you're new, I invite you to open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And as you're finding your place, I just want to make a public declaration. June is my favorite month. And uh, the reason for that is, is people celebrate me. Uh, in, in the month of June, I'm a father, and so I appreciate the fact that people recognize that I'm a father of a tribe of four, and all of those four love God. They seem to love me, and by God's grace, they love the church, and that is a miracle. It's also uh, my birthday, um, so I got to celebrate my birthday. Happy birthday to me. Uh, and in between uh, my birthday and Father's Day, um, we get to celebrate Juneteenth, which is so important important to so many of our African-American black brothers and sisters in Christ. And let me just say to many of our black brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, thank you for your patience for those of us that uh, are slow to learn our history. Um, if you aren't aware of Juneteenth, uh, let me just read to you a post from Pastor Stephen Love that he posted yesterday. It says, happy Juneteenth, a brief timeline, July the 4th, 1776. Final wording of the Declaration of Independence. Certain Americans were free from the tyranny of Britain, while many still owned slaves. 87 years later, January the 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln. Two and a half years after that, on June the 19th, 1865, Texas finally complied and the slaves were emancipated. And then he says, no one is free until we are all free. And while the world presents unbiblical theories and worldviews for racial reconciliation, Christians know that the heart of all racial tension is sin. And the only solution for sin is redemption in Christ. God's word tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that there is, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And so while there may be division out there, in here, what unites us is our mutual submission to the authority of the Word of God. Amen. Speaking of the authority of the Word of God, we've been learning about the authority of the Word of God. The Bible describes what I'm about to do here for the next 40 minutes or so as foolishness, and the world would agree. Yet, preaching is God's chosen means to save sinners and sanctify disciples. It never ceases to amaze me that you people scrape yourselves out of bed on Sunday morning. You stop all other activity. You drag your children to this place and you sit and you open God's word and you listen to a man who spent his week preparing for this moment to preach God's word. Preaching is so important to the health of a church that the elders call the church together every week. They call everybody to stop every other activity that you're doing. And they tell us everybody else in the church is to stop talking. And everybody is to listen to the same message delivered from God's word. There are a lot of things that can go bad in a church and the church can still survive. As a matter of fact, I can list them for you. Whatever critiques you have of our church, I assure you my list is longer than yours. But if the preaching goes bad, the church cannot survive. Preaching is the first pillar of Gospel City Church. We say it this way. We believe in the unapologetic preaching of the authority of the Word of God. The preacher has no authority unless he is preaching the authoritative Word of God. The authority is in 
the word, not in the man. But when the word is in the mouth of the man, that's authoritative preaching. And it requires deep thought. It inquires intense focus. It inquires hours of communion with God. Because we believe that when God's word is preached, God speaks to his church. So are you ready to hear the word of God? Let's read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, just two verses. Can you handle two verses in church this morning? Here's all it says. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. We've learned the context. These are Paul's final words. We finally arrived at the final chapter of the final book that the Apostle Paul will write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is Paul's attempt to fan the flame of faith inside of Timothy into a raging inferno. He knows Timothy will soon be on his own. Paul's trying to pass the baton to Timothy, and he wants to assure him he's going to have everything he needs to live as, in, in a way that pleases God and to lead the church as long as he is rooted in the Word of God. And so, he points to the sufficiency of the Bible and he, that he's learned from his grandmother and his mother and now his spiritual father, Paul. And he wants Timothy to embrace the challenge, take the baton and preach the word. In Paul's absence, Timothy's not going to be able to lean upon the wisdom of an older mentor. He's going to have to rely upon the sufficiency of God's word. That's true for us too. The Bible is our sufficiency. Over the last few weeks, we've been learning the doctrine of the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Raise your hand if you believe the Bible. Anybody want to wave your Bible around? You want to stand up and cheer? I mean, you, like in, in, there are certain places where if I said that, people would audibly respond. You would like another shot at that? Do you believe the Bible? I like that. I like that. I'm thinking Stephen's church would do better even than that. But, uh, but we're catching up to speed here, okay? So if you believe the Bible, here's what we've said we believe about the Bible. We believe in the necessity of the Bible. And we said it this way. We believe the, believe the Bible is essential for a saving knowledge of God and living a life pleasing to God. You can commune with God in a deer stand. You can know some things about God by looking at a tree, but the Bible's essential for knowing the things about God that we need to know in order to be saved. We also believe in the inspiration of the Bible. Do you believe in the inspiration of the Bible? All right, all right, you're a little slow, but keep coming with me, all right? Keep coming. We, we say we believe in the inspiration of the Bible. We believe the Bible is the God-breathed Word of God in the same way that I am forming words because there is breath being pressed out of my lungs through my vocal cords, over my mouth, in the same sense, God inspired the verbal words that are recorded on the page. The Holy Spirit influenced the writers of Scripture so that what they wrote were the words of God. And God assured that what they wrote was without error. It was accurate. We also believe in the authority of the Bible. Do you believe in the authority of the Bible? All right, be careful with this one now. You, you might not be so excited when you understand what we're saying here. You see, I, what we're saying is I believe the Bible has the authority to define what I believe and to determine how I behave. You're like, oh, I didn't know it meant that. I'm like, I'm going to have to like actually change when I read it. Yeah, see, do you really believe the Bible? And we summed it up in a statement. We, we said this. I believe the Bible. It is the word of God. Every word of God is true. 
and where what the Bible teaches is different than my belief, my attitude, my action, I will change. Do you really believe that? You want to say that with me? Let's say it together. Put it up on the screen here. Let's say it together. I believe the Bible. It is the word of God. Every word of God is true. They didn't put it up, did they? All right, you ready now? Let's say it together. Here we go. I believe the Bible. It is the word of God. Every word of God is true. And if what the Bible teaches is different than my belief, my action, my attitude, I will change by the power of God's spirit. Still believe the Bible? All right, we got one more place to go, and that is today. We believe in the proclamation of the Bible. Here's what we mean. I believe preaching the Bible is the primary means that sinners are saved and disciples are made. Preaching is for everybody. Those that have yet to put faith in Christ need to be preached to. Those who have put faith in Christ still need to be preached to. In Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul talks about the primacy of preaching. He said it this way, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How many of you believe that? You believe that? Like, okay, well, he asked some questions then. If we really believe that, he asked this question, how will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in whom they have never heard? And how are they to preach? Or how, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. How many of you have beautiful feet? How many of you right now would be ashamed if, if we actually got a look at your feet? Do you know the person here with the most beautiful feet is the one who regularly, continually, unapologetically preaches the authority of the Word of God? So he says in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the preaching of the Word of God. Now, I would preach this message differently if I was in a seminary classroom or maybe in our uh, Great Commission Collective Training Center where we bring some budding preachers in and we kind of give them some tools. Th that's not my assignment today. My, my assignment is to preach to you, the collection, the congregation of Gospel City Church. So what we're going to do today is we're going to answer seven questions from this passage of Scripture. I'm going to give you the questions up front, then we're going to go through them pretty quickly. Number one, what is preaching? Number two, who is to preach? Number three, why do we preach? Number four, what do we preach? Number five, when do we preach? Number six, how do we preach? And finally, to whom do we preach? We see it here in verse two. The first word just simply says, preach, preach the word. So we need to answer the question, what does that word mean? You may get in your mind of a flaming hellfire and brimstone pulpit pounding preacher. Um, Preaching is not less than that, but it's so much more. The word preach means to herald. It means to proclaim publicly. In the first century, if people heard this word herald, the actual word there is uh, cariso, I believe it is, it, to, a herald would be someone who was acting as an imperial messenger, going through the streets to announce special events, such as the anticipated arrival of the emperor. And of course, if the emperor was coming, you better clean up town. And that is the same is true of us. If Jesus is coming as king, then I need to clean up my life. And that's what a good preacher tells us to do. His message was delivered with urgency and it demanded immediate attention and action. It was a message that couldn't be ignored because of its importance. Timothy needed to hear Paul's charge to preach with urgency. Why? Because he was a kid. 
He was youthful. He was fearful. Remember how timid he was? And Paul said, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. That's coming from your flesh. Get rid of that. If you're going to be a preacher, you're going to have to be fearless. He likely felt too inexperienced and inadequate to preach. By the way, everybody who preaches feels inadequate to preach. I feel that every Sunday morning when I get up here. Don't quite sure know if I've got the words right. Am I going to say them right? Am I going to, you know, I, am I going to commit heresy even as I'm trying to explain the Bible? Not trying to do that, but I live in that fear. I wonder how you're going to respond to it. I wonder how you're going to re- react. But Timothy uh, was intimidated because the people he was preaching to were more educated than him. And many times they stood in opposition to the doctrines of Christ and his exclusive claims to save sinner. I'm sure, like me, Timothy would rather have been well-liked and popular. I'm sure that he would have liked everyone to agree with him. And yet, those who boldly and unapologetically proclaim the authority of God's, God's Word risk rejection. Even people who like the preaching of God's Word rarely invite preachers to their parties because preachers tend to be party poopers because party people tend to sin when they're partying. And who wants to invite the preacher to come to the party if he's just going to call everybody at the party to repent of sin? Yet authentic preachers can do nothing other than preach. Preaching is heralding. Now, that distinguishes preaching from teaching. If you're not heralding, you're not preaching. John Piper calls preaching expository exaltation. John Piper roots everything in worship. The end game of preaching is worship. The purpose of preaching is to pack the truth of God's Word like kindling in the furnace of the human heart while praying that the Holy Spirit will provide the spark that will ignite an inferno of worship. That's my goal every time I preach. Lord, just help me to pack enough word into the hearts of these people so that by your spirit you would spark a flame and it would ignite worship and response and obedience and faith and courage and and, and love for Jesus Christ. That's what a good preacher does. Martin Lloyd-Jones defined preaching this way. Preaching is theology coming through a man who is on fire. Charles Spurgeon said, all I try to do every week is just get up and burn in front of people, and people gather around and warm themselves around the fire. Philip Brooks said, preaching is truth communicated through personality. Preachers have all kinds of different personalities. One of the greatest mistakes you can make in preaching is try to preach like somebody else. You can learn a lot of things from other preachers and absorb things from preachers, but you've got to preach through the personality that God has given you. Some of you don't like my personality, so you probably don't like my preaching. But there are other preachers. I would invite you to go find someone that preaches faithfully, that through his personality meets the needs of your heart. Preaching is proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology. The preacher has no authority apart from the Scripture he preaches. Preaching is the delivery system for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think through intelligence we know that there are some rogue nations out there that are working on a nuclear bomb, and they may even have a nuclear warhead. The reason they're not a threat is because they haven't delivered, they haven't developed the delivery system to get that thing to a place where it can cause damage. Preaching is the delivery system for the power of God's Word. And so we lean into the delivery system. We want the delivery system to work, to be precise, to be accurate. Preaching is exposing people to the will and the ways of God. Not my will and ways, but just to open the Bible. Hmm, what does God say about himself? What does God say about man? What does God say about salvation? What does God say about eternity, about life? And preaching, a faithful preacher will expose people to what God has said. We get our word expository preaching 
from the word expose. That's what a faithful preacher does. He just exposes people to what God has already declared about himself. And as we see here in verse 2, preaching is reproving, rebuking, exhorting, and teaching directly from a text of Scripture. So, that's what preaching is. Secondly, who is to preach? I would just say to you, everyone is a preacher of something. Do you know that everyone is an evangelist of what they worship? If you worship a football team, guess what you're going to try to do? You're going to try to convert people to cheer for your football team. Everybody's a preacher. Everyone has a sermon to convert you to what they w- believe will save you. That means that every commercial is a sermon. Every social media post is a sermon. Every podcast, every song, every movie, every book, every political platform is a sermon. Every news story is a sermon. Every political commentator is a preacher. Every teacher in every school at every university is preaching something. That means for those of us that are disciples of Jesus Christ, we're preachers too. Because every disciple is called to fulfill the great commission. We're all called to preach. How many of you are keeping up with the 100 days Bible reading through the New Testament? Raise those hands. How many of you are a little behind? Raise your left hand. All right, catch up, catch up. So yesterday, if you're on pace here, you would have read Luke chapter 9, where Jesus sent out the 12 and gave them the authority to preach, to proclaim. The word is proclaimed in the ESV. It's the same word that Paul used here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And he gets to the end of chapter 9, and he finds this one reluctant guy. He's like, I would follow you, but i got to go bury my dead father. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. As for you, you go proclaim the kingdom of God. And then today, if you get to, to, to chapter 10, you're going to find out that now there's 72 that he sends out to proclaim. Every disciple is a preacher because every disciple is responsible to fulfill the Great Commission. Long before I was ever behind a pulpit in a church on a Sunday, I felt compelled to tell my friends about Jesus. I learned some Bible verses. I memorized them. I kind of learned a little outline, and I just... Every day would just go to school praying that God would give me an opportunity to, to tell somebody about the things that I knew, very limited knowledge at that point in my life as a 16-year-old. But uh, I've preached on porch, front porches. I've preached on football fields. I've preached in high school classrooms. I've preached in hallways. And I've preached some of my best sermons in my 1967 Mustang when I was a teenager. And uh, I've seen people come to Christ long before I ever got behind a pulpit in a church on a Sunday. But do you know that every person in this room has a pulpit? Are you familiar with what a pulpit is? A pulpit is, is just essentially a piece of furniture. It's, and we got a fancy stainless steel one up here. And, and this is kind of a, it's symbolic of, this is where the preaching happens. Listen, most of you will never get to preach behind this pulpit. Every one of you has a pulpit and a congregation every day, and you're responsible for what you preach behind that pulpit. Your pulpit could be a classroom. Your pulpit could be a a ball field or a battlefield. It could be a cubicle or a factory. It could be a coffee shop or a dinner table or your living room. Everybody has a pulpit and everybody has a congregation. Your congregation could be your family. It could be your co-workers or your social media followers. The question is not, are you a preacher? The question is, what are you preaching? How much of what you are preaching with conviction and passion is saturated in the words of God. Some of you are false preachers. Your doctrines don't align with the doctrines of God. They're man-centered, they're man-made. We are called to preach God's word. Now, there are some who are specifically called by God to the office 
of pastor, teacher, or preacher in the church. And listen, only after a man's been faithful and proven his effectiveness in preaching outside the church should he be entrusted with the pulpit inside the church. There's so many preachers in pulpits today, right now, who are failing in their assignment to preach God's Word. They're in a church, they're behind a pulpit, but they simply don't believe that preaching has the power to transform lives. And so you know what they're doing? They're telling stories, they're entertaining, they're telling jokes, and they're building a crowd, but they're not preaching the Word. Third question, why do we preach? That's what verse 1 is all about. I want you to look at verse 1. He says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. He says, preach. That's why we preach. Why? Because we are in the presence of God, namely Jesus Christ. The word charge there is actually one word in Greek. It means uh, to strongly warn someone. To, it has explicit legal connotations. It means to testify under oath as in a courtroom of law before a witness. Now, who are the witnesses? The witnesses are listed right there. God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity is the witness to our preaching. We preach in the presence of God in Jesus Christ. Listen, if I ever forget that my primary audience is anyone other than God, I will be scared to death to preach. My primary audience is not the congregation here today. My primary accountability is not you, it's not the elder team. I am primarily accountable to God, namely Jesus Christ. Preachers preach in the presence of God. He's watching, he's listening, and he's saying, Trent, don't mess it up. Speak it boldly, unapologetically, with compassion and conviction. Now listen, every preacher battles the fear of man. I've told people many times, my besetting sin, if you want to know how to pray for your preacher, my besetting sin is the fear of man. I like to be liked. I like to be praised. I like people to say nice things about me. I don't like to get critical email. I am already dreading the emails that I'm going to get on Monday because I mentioned Juneteenth in church. And yet my primary place of approval does not come from you. It comes from God. Who is the judge? Do you see it right there? He is the judge. Preachers will be judged by God. This is our greatest motivation. We can't do anything about the dead. He's the judge of the living and the dead. I can't do anything about the dead people. I, like I, I didn't get there soon enough, sorry. But I can do something about those that are still alive. He's going to judge the living and the dead. And a preacher's job is to preach justification by faith so that those who will believe will escape the impending judgment of God. Listen, you will not be judged by your preacher. So many people come to you, oh, he's just being so judgmental. Listen, you won't be judged by the preacher. You're not going to be judged by me. You will be judged by God, and preachers preach because they love you enough to tell you you will be judged by God. Preachers are willing to risk being rejected by people so that people will not be rejected by God. The words of a faithful preacher have the power to change the verdict you will receive when you are judged by God, if you respond in repentance and faith to the preached word of God. He also says that we preach by his appearing and his kingdom. God, God sends preachers to preach until the appearance of Jesus and his kingdom. Jesus is coming soon. You say, how soon? I'm like, how much time do I got? How, much, how, how long can I put this off before I actually repent and believe? Listen, I don't know when he's coming. I don't know how long you have, but I got to tell you, time is running out. 
Don't delay, don't procrastinate, don't put off responding to the preaching of the word of God. If you are under the conviction of God's spirit, respond immediately and humbly and faithfully every time God's spirit convicts you through the preaching of God's word. Next question, what do we preach? Tells us in verse two, very simply, preach what? The word. What does he mean by the word? Just, is it just like one word? Does I just go shout, Jesus? Do I just go shout, repent? What's the word? What's the one word? Just tell me the one word, I'll go preach. Now listen, he's talking about the entire body of all of the words God has spoken in the Bible. One of the reasons that I left my previous ministry where I was kind of an itinerant preacher and I'd go into the church and, and we'd stay for a short-term high-impact service and then we'd pack it up and move it down the road is because I was limited in what I could preach. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a church planting pastor is because I wanted to do what it says in Acts 20, 27. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. There's so many things to preach, and it's going to take a lifetime even to unpack the things that God wants us to preach, preach the Word. Now, we believe in expository preaching as the primary means that we expose people to the Word of God. That means that we don't preach based on what your felt need is. We really don't focus too much on topical things, even though from time to time we address it that way. Uh, We don't ask you what you'd like to hear We just simply open the Bible and expose you verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, to what God has said so that you'll know what to do when you have a felt need. At the beginning of this week, um, I began to get reports of a dear family in our church whose 22-year-old son had a very aggressive brain tumor who was immediately moved to Memphis, St. Jude's Children Research Hospital, the Bonner Hospital down there to receive the best care that he could possibly receive. His parents went down there. I had the opportunity to visit them in Memphis this week. And and it was so, it was so beautiful just to be able to engage. You kind of wonder, you know, how are they doing spiritually? Are they mature enough to handle this kind of stuff? You know what? They were quoting scripture to me. I was going to offer them Nahum 1.7 that meant so much to me when, when Andrea was diagnosed with cancer. Nahum 1.7 says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And before I could get the last part out, they quoted the rest of the verse to me. He knows those who take refuge in him. Listen, everything that has ever been preached to you is to prepare you for that kind of crisis that is coming. A couple of days after that, I heard about another precious couple in our church who was due to deliver a child on Monday. On Saturday, she was concerned. She didn't feel movement. That child was stillborn on Sunday. We had the funeral here on Thursday. And yet it was, it was a family that had rooted themselves in the comfort and the care of the Word of God. And they, will, they were able to minister to other family members who would actually um, distance themselves from some of the things in God's Word. Everything that's ever been preached to you is preparing you for the time when you're going to need it most. So what do we preach? We don't preach ourselves. Notice this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced disgraceful and un. Hand, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Then verse five, for, we, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Any sermon that doesn't point to Christ Jesus as Lord is not a faithful sermon. The end game is the worship and the surrender and the obedience of people to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We're not called to preach the platform of the Republican Party. 
We're not called to preach the platform of the Democratic Party. We're not called to preach theories or sociology or psychology. We're not called to preach our opinions on masks or vaccines. We're not called to preach against communism or capitalism. We're not called to preach our preferences or our religious traditions. We are called to preach the Word of God. This means we must know the Word of God. If you're not quoting, explaining, or applying a text of the Bible to any particular topic, you are not preaching. You're just talking. And when you are just talking, you have no right to be believed as authoritative. But when you open the Bible and take people to what God has said on any topic, calling people to repent and to believe what God has said while giving them specific and practical ways to apply God's word to what God has said, now you're preaching the word of God. That's what the world needs, not your political opinion. Next question, when do we preach? It tells us, it says, be ready in season and out of season. So we preach when we're ready to preach. Ready means prepared. It means instantly available to be deployed at a moment's notice. It carries the idea of suddenness. It means never caught off guard. It means I could share the gospel at any moment when the opportunity arises. Are you ready to preach? Do you know enough Bible that at the moment someone needs to hear God's word, you've got a word for them from God's word? Not, not some vision or revelation that you just had in, you know, aspiration to share, but there's words of God's rattling around in your head all the time and words from the Bible that are rattling around in your heart. And when you see a need, like, hey, I just, I just read this. Like, I've been reading this Bible thing in like 100 days, and I read this thing in Luke chapter 10 this morning, and I just wanted to share it with you. Now you're preaching. Are you ready to preach? You're not ready to preach until the Word has saturated your mind and your heart. You're not ready to preach until you're prepared to be rejected and marginalized and criticized. There's a cost for those who preach the Word of God without apology. You are not ready to preach until the Word, you, you're not ready to preach the Word until you fear God more than you fear man. We're to preach in season. This means that we're to preach when it's convenient, and we're to preach out of season when it's inconvenient. Let me ask you a question. Right now, in our culture, 2021, America, Midwest, do you think that it's in season or out of season to preach the Word of God unapologetically? How many of you say, it's in season? It's in season. How many of you say it's out of season? It's out of season. Some of you, how many of you are too afraid to vote? Okay, most of you. All right, that's why I come. You just tell me, what are we, what, are we in season or are we out of season? Okay? Now listen, it kind of depends. There was a time in our country, I think before I was born, I think I kind of wrecked things apparently somewhere around 1967. Like there was a time when preaching was in season. People respected preaching and preachers, and even if you didn't believe it, you had a certain measure of respect that people that held these things. And that's not true anymore of our culture. And yet, um, compared to the culture that Paul was living in and Timothy that he was writing to, do you think Paul or Timothy would say preaching is in season in this culture compared to their season or out of season? They're like, man, you got a lot more freedom to preach God's word than we do. Paul's getting ready to have his head cut off for preaching God's word. Anybody have any family members that happened? That, that, that didn't happen this week for you. So I think Paul and Timothy would say, what are you waiting for? You have an open door, an opportunity. I could make this case from Scripture that there has never been more opportunity to preach God's Word than we have right here, right now, in our culture at this time. It's never been more needed. It would, it would distinguish you from every other Thing that everybody's ever preached and everybody's coming out of the closet. Why don't you come out as a preacher and just tell people what God has said in relation to the things that the culture is talking about? Next question. 
How do we preach? How do we preach? Preaching the Word involves two negative commands and two positive commands. First, the negative commands. It says we reprove and we rebuke. We talked about that a little bit a couple of weeks ago. Reproving and rebuking is like the diagnosis that the doctor gives you when you got something wrong inside your body. If you go to the doctor and he says you have a brain tumor in your knee, do you want him to tell you the truth? Is that information that you would find, like, no, I, I need to know that information. Well, it's painful to hear. It, it would really wreck your whole world. That's what a faithful doctor does. That's what a faithful preacher does. You want the doctor to tell you the truth. Now, around here, there is a commonly repeated phrase that happens in the preaching. And some of you already know what I'm about to say. Quite often... A preacher up here will tell you that you are a dirty, rotten, some of you are already completing the phrase, aren't you? You know this, right? Some of you are very good preachers. Some some of you have memorized that sermon. Some of you go tell the world, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. Well, really, the, the idea is I'm telling that to myself and I'm reminding you of what is true of me and you. And that is a way to bring a measure of reproof and rebuke to people who are prone to exalt themselves and to live independently of God and to think, I don't need grace anymore. And so we preach the truth about sin. Now, I get it. Some people are like, well, wait a minute. I'm, 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 I'm saved. The blood of Jesus has covered my sin and, and, and I, I, I'm justified before God. I mean, don't leave out that part about being loved and chosen and redeemed and not forsaken. Remember all those parts too? Yes, yes. We believe all of that is true. But there is still in our hearts something that needs to be confronted about sin. So I, I received a letter even in, in, in the last weeks about somebody like challenging me. I'm like, I don't think it's very healthy to be telling us that. I mean, we're, we're in Christ now, and we're, what about a union in Christ? All those things that we preach around here as well. And so, you know, and he even made a statement. He's like, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of the children, you know, that would hear this statement. And it would just seem like, um, what, what would the children do if we just tell them they're dirty, rotten sinners? And then the next week, I got a text from somebody in our church, a mom who was homeschooling her kid, and she gave the assignment, and the kid um, answered the question to, um, uh, this. the question was, how do, how do we get saved? How do we know that we are saved? And the answer came, the answer was this, just put the picture up. It says, I thought, um, the picture says, what must we do to be saved? And the child says, you must believe. You are a dirty, rotten sinner and confess. That's a Gospel City kid right there. So, and the mom was thrilled. You know, I was like, hey, he's, he's getting it. It's like, I'm, because the mom's convinced he's a dirty, rotten sinner. And so he, you know, he's conviction of the Holy Spirit coming upon the kid. Now listen, it's like, do you have any biblical mandate for like saying this? Well, there's, there's some places in the Bible that actually kind of says that. Look, look at James chapter four. Notice this verse. It says, but he gives more grace. How many of you need more grace? Who would like to have more grace? There's only one way to get it. James says, therefore, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. You dirty, rotten sinners. I mean, I I editorialize a little bit there, but it's right there. Now, by, by the way, he's preaching to the church here. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. It doesn't get better. Look at verse 9. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. As Christians, we will constantly be dealing with the sin underneath our sin. It's not just our behavioral missteps. It's this bent inside of us. It's our flesh. It's this sinful nature that we will wrestle with until the day that the Lord delivers us from this body of sin. Preaching involves two negative commands. It also involves two positive commands. And the words here are exhort with complete patience and teaching. 
Exhortation is encouragement. Exhortation is the prescription after you receive the diagnosis. Yeah, you got a brain tumor in your knee, but we can do surgery on that. And we got medicine for that. You should apply this. There's things that you can do. There's physical therapy. And you, can, you don't have to live with all of that sin. That's the exhortation. It's the call to change. It means to compel. It means to motivate, to persuade, and to cheer. You did it. You can do it. You've wrapped your life around the Word of God. Preaching is the bold proclamation of both truth and grace. Any preaching that is absent of truth is not biblical preaching. Any preaching that is absent of grace is not biblical preaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the apostle Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. There's a lot of preachers that are noisy gongs and clanging cymbals because they leave out love. The preacher who speaks with truth without love is a brutal Pharisee. And the preacher who speaks with love without truth is a false teacher who is preaching a false gospel. To whom do we preach? Do you know who we preach first to? We preach to ourselves. Have you, find, have you found that you quite often are in the habit of talking to yourself? How many of you, like, I talk to myself all the time. Have you learned the discipline of preaching to yourself? Reminding yourself of the truth of God's Word? Calling yourself to repent and believe in response to every time God speaks? in his word. We first preach to ourselves, but then we need to preach to others. I want you to stand with me right now. Who do you know in your congregation, your classroom, your ball team, your factory, who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? who needs to be compelled, who needs someone to come alongside of them and enter into their life and to be bold enough to risk even rejection from that friend, to love them enough to tell them the truth about the authority of God's word. Who's coming to mind right now? Is it a brother or sister? Is it a son or a daughter? Listen, on Father's Day, dads, you are the preacher in your home. It is your responsibility to open God's word and to expose your family to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're all preachers, and we preach to those who have yet to believe. Do you know that there are still two billion people on the planet who do not know a preacher? They do not know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows a preacher. And we've got to do things to get to people who have yet to have God's word delivered to them. We've got to remind ourselves of the truth and the grace. Listen, every time I tell you you're a dirty, rotten sinner, number one, I'm saying that to me, but it's always in the context of a service that ends with three words. You are loved. Here's the truth. God loves dirty, rotten sinners. God justifies dirty, rotten sinners who will humble themselves and admit they are who God says they are. I am who God says I am. I am a dirty, rotten sinner, and I am loved. I'm chosen. I'm not forsaken. I am someone for whom God is for. God's not against me. I am who God says I am. That's the only response to the preaching of God's Word.